Coming up, our very own Holly Cook Macaro shares her memorable night inside a glittering White House state dinner, an event few get to experience. And ICT uncovers the snags in the newly simplified FAFSA application process. Those interviews, plus headlines on the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT newscast with Aliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Amid Alahopa, thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. Officials from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration say we are in the middle of a worldwide coral bleaching event. This marks the fourth ever on record and the second in the last decade, according to scientists. It happens when coral turn completely white due to stressful conditions like high temperatures. This impacts ecosystems, economies, and livelihoods. With warming oceans, the administration says that prediction models suggest coral bleaching will happen more often often in the future. In Alaska, indigenous leaders are fresh off an Arctic symposium to make their message known, nothing about us without us. Six Inupiaq, Clinket, and Athabascan leaders joined others from an estimated 30 countries to kick off Arctic Encounter 2024. It started with a session emphasizing self-governance and that indigenous issues need to be heard at the international level. Indigenous youth were also a talking point with leaders saying they will be the next generation to continue the fight. We head now to New York City, where an indigenous basketball player has been drafted to the WNBA. Alyssa Peely was drafted in the first round to the Minnesota Lynx as the eighth overall pick, which was higher than what experts were predicting. The Samoan and Inupiaq star became the seventh player to be selected from the University of Utah and just the third overall to be selected in the first round. Peely signed a four-year deal paying more than $324,000 total. Speaking to Holly Rowe on representation, she explained a lot of indigenous and Polynesian girls don't get to see role models, and she feels blessed to be that for them. The world-renowned art event, the Venice Biennale, is finally here, and Jeffrey Gibson is the featured artist. He's a citizen of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. Here we have photos from the exhibition by Timothy Schneck. I have addressed every part of it. So we've redone the front, uh, like the kind of, um, what do we call it? We call it the forecourt, which is kind of, you know, it has these two flanking sides and there's a courtyard. So there's a large central sculpture that sits in the center there, which is meant to be activated. The exhibition is presented by the Portland Art Museum in Oregon and Site Santa Fe in New Mexico. It's on view April 20th to November 24th. Several special programs are scheduled throughout the run. Gibson is the first Indigenous artist to represent the U.S. with a solo exhibition at the Venice Biennale. It's entitled The Space in Which to Place Me, from a poem by Lele Long Soldier, who is Oglala Lakota. Shirley Snavy, ICT News. In the world of entertainment, more Indigenous talent is coming to your screens soon. After the success of the live-action adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender, the franchise is getting its first movie in 2025. A couple of familiar faces were in the recent cast announcement for voice actors, including Jessica Matten from the TV show Dark Winds and Roman Zaragoza from the series Ghosts. Well, actor Lily Gladstone stars in a new crime crom excuse me, in a new true crime drama called Under the Bridge, and it drops today on Hulu. Gladstone was in Los Angeles on Monday for the show's premiere. While promoting the new series, Gladstone was asked about her whirlwind experience as the Oscar-nominated star in the film Killers of the Flower Moon and what it meant for her Blackfeet nation. 
It'll take a while before the impact of what actually happened hits because you're so in the moment. But I think when it really hit for me was when my nation is a confederacy with three bands in Canada and they all jointly decided to bring me into Women's Headdress Society and honor me. Surely for um, the representation that uh, this whole awards run gave to all of these young Blackfeet kids, Blackfoot kids, Indigenous kids everywhere. And I think getting to walk out of that and immediately feel what that impact was in such an overwhelmingly beautiful way, it just, um, it really, I think I'm still going to be kind of piecing together what the, what the uh, long-term effects of it are, but to have so much love and positivity and, you know, celebration of Indigenous life and joy in the wake of, you know, talking about that, that film, that story, that history, and what it did for everybody, and, you know, it was such a, it was an incredible moment. A state dinner is described as one of the grandest and most glamorous of affairs. It is held when a head of government visits the White House. That was the case last week when President Joe Biden hosted the Japanese Prime Minister. Among those invited were ICT regular contributor Holly Cook Makaro and her husband Mark, who is the president of the National Congress of American Indians. Holly, we're so happy that you're here with us. How do you even begin to describe the pomp and circumstance of this state dinner? Well, it was surreal um, for a number of reasons. One, it, it um, you know, being invited to a state dinner, it's, it's one of the most prestigious invites in Washington, D.C. And um, Mark and I were further honored with a seat at the head table, which was a surprise to us. So in addition to the number of, of attendees there who were just extraordinary leaders, um, in the United States and in the in in the community and with Prime Min the Prime Minister and his wife there, it really was an extraordinary evening, and I, I think I'm I'm still processing it as well. Tell us about the moment that you first received this invitation. What was your reaction? Well, I um, I'm actually in Paris today, and I had a, a trip planned, um, this trip along with a trip to London, but delayed that when the invitation came in and um it was obviously an invitation that you can't say no to and um to be invited to a state dinner is is such a, a rare and an extraordinary opportunity to uh, to to represent and to participate and um you know be at the table like we always talk about so when that invitation came in we immediately you know cleared the calendars and made arrangements to make sure that we were there and um and said yes to president and dr biden you've been inside the white house many times but never for a state dinner what were your first impressions of the evening uh it's extremely you know Glittery, I, I would say the the White House I thought looked just extraordinarily beautiful. As you know, the state dinner was for the Japanese Prime Minister and his visit to the United States last week. And state dinners are held to, uh, you know, cement relationships with with our allies and those we have um, relationships with around the world. And this is the spring cherry blossom season in Washington D.C. And the White House was decorated with that theme and uh it, it really was beautiful the 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 marine band was playing as as one entered the white house and uh you know that that famous kind of a traditional walk through through the room there was de decorated with with fans and um you know from there it was um a reception kind of on the first floor of the white house there and um in in the library in the red room and um, with it was really an opportunity to, to visit with with members of Congress, with leaders from around the world. Jeff Bezos was there from Amazon, Tim Cook from Apple, many others who um, were were there in attendance that that were in the mix. So it was really extraordinary. You said earlier, Holly, that you found yourself seated at the head table and you were actually sitting next to President Bill Clinton. How did you feel about that seating arrangement and what did you and President Clinton talk about during the dinner? 
It was a bit of a full circle moment for me when I first um, began my work in Washington, D.C. I, I was an intern in the, in the Clinton White House and then a staff assistant in intergovernmental affairs doing Indian affairs um, under Lynn Cutler, who was his special assistant for Native American issues. And so I had you know, done work um, with President Clinton. I had worked with, with Secretary Clinton on her presidential campaign in a number of capacities. So um, sitting next to President Clinton, I was, I was happy, to, happy to see him. It was a, a terrific visit. We talked about the Native vote um, you know the the importance and and opportunities there certainly um, in in both both in the last election and 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 the, that power that lies in that native vote. We he told a, a a story about a tribal leader who was there from South Dakota, and um, back in the early '90s when the when Bosnia was an issue for him and the. Um, he, he talked about how that tribal leader made a reference to service in Indian country um, in the military. We talked about that issue. And we talked about what what you know how how Indian country has changed since he was in the White House. I always really felt um, then, and it was reinforced for me again that President Clinton, he has a deep and abiding interest in Indian affairs and cares deeply about that issue. I, I encouraged him to continue to be active and engaged. Holly, in a post on social media, you mentioned that President Joe Biden, who was also sitting near you, gave you a thumbs up during the dinner. What goes through your mind in that moment? I, uh, you know, at the dinner, I had, I had Governor Roy Cooper from, from the state of North Carolina um, on my left. I had President Clinton. And then two seats down was was President President Biden. And I glanced down at one point, you know, and, and made and he was looking at me and he gave me, you know, a little like, Heads out, you know, a little thumbs up. And I really did think that, you know, I'm a kid that was born in an Indian hospital on the Red Lake Indian Reservation and looking out and seeing, you know, the the luminaries that were in 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 the audience. And and my husband Mark was sitting next to Secretary Clinton and also having a very good visit. I really kind of pinched myself and thought, how did I get here? It was really kind of surreal for me. Holly, we'll end it there. Thank you so much again for joining us and telling us about this absolutely incredible experience. Yes, I do want to mention that the I, um, a number of folks really stepped forward in making sure that I was able to represent. And Dante Bis Grayson had a wonderful gown. Jennifer Younger and her daughter-in-law Shelby with with the jewelry and uh, the George Bennett um, bolo tie that Mark wore. We really. I, I was appreciative of everyone who stepped forward to make sure that we had the opportunity to represent Indian country in that respect as well. Well, Holly, thanks again. Yes, thank you, Aaliyah. It is FAFSA week at the Department of Education. That is the free application for federal student aid. ICT education reporter Renata Birkenbuehl has more on the rollout of what's being called a simplified application, but hasn't been a smooth rollout. The rollout uh, has been uh, quite a challenge. And one of the big reasons for that is uh, because of all the glitches that the system rolled out with, but then also not too long ago, all the uh, calculation errors and, and the wrong tax information being inserted into some of the forms uh, from the IRS uh, due to the new data exchange process that is currently in place. Um, so with that said, uh, you know, schools uh, have not been able to process uh, the information that they would have already received at this point in time, uh, which is known as an ICER. Uh, so an ICER record is an international student identification record, which this is the data that the schools need to be able to generate to calculate financial aid and in turn, you know, send them an award offer. Uh, so many students at this point in time, you know, have not received a lot of this information like they normally would. Uh, the biggest thing is everything has been delayed. Everything has been pushed back. Uh, typically, the FAFSA form is available October of every year, October 1st of every year. When a, when a student goes online and completes the FAFSA form, they select the colleges and universities that they're interested in attending in the fall of that year. 
Now, those schools that they get accepted to uh, will send them an award letter. Schools cannot generate an award letter until first, number one, you know, the, uh, they get they receive that ISA record from the uh, federal student aid. Uh, the ISA record has all the data they need to be able to calculate the amount of federal aid they will be able to offer that student. Okay. That would be within the award letter that is sent directly to the student. Okay. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, typically that's what would be happening right now at this point in time. Uh, things would be actually rolling, right? We're in April right now. They'd be receiving these letters right now already. I, I'm anticipating they will not start seeing these letters this year. Uh, until probably mid-May uh, or even possibly late May. Reyes said applications for financial aid are down 27% in New Mexico and 40% nationwide. He does believe that once the glitches are fixed, it will be a good system. With the new FAFSA simplification, there's a lot of new things that are coming forward that we're supposed to be working that are not, but they will eventually. We will get there eventually, and and you know we we want to stay positive. Uh, but one of the big things, of course, is the new formula. They have a new uh, formula, which is actually going to expand more federal aid to more students. So that's a positive thing. More students are going to be able to get more federal aid. Uh, the other thing is the streamlined process. The the uh, the uh, FAFSA form typically had over 100 questions. Now, with this new form, it could be as few as 18, but typically it's probably going to be about 40 or so. Uh, the other thing that the new FAFSA sim simplification does, it expands uh, the flexibility that financial aid professionals have in, in, in awarding aid, and that's awesome. The, giving them some more flexibility is a good thing to working with our students and families. Uh, and then also for the homeless uh, determination, it's supposed to make that just a little bit easier as well uh, for students that are homeless. Every state offers assistance to students and parents. A good place to start is high schools or the State's Department of Education. Reyes said New Mexico resident students are able to get free tuition to state schools. Renata Birkenbuehl, ICT News. So I wanted to check in to see how everything was going with your pregnancy too. Your food choices affect you, it affects your baby, and it affects your family. It's important to have a balanced diet with foods from all of the different food groups. Carbohydrates, water, fats, protein, vitamins, and minerals, all great things for baby. It's going to be 17 and a half teaspoons of sugar in one can of iced tea. I'm gonna back off on the Arizona yeah. tea for some time. <laughs> I really love and enjoy the program. It was an easy connection for us when I first met her. It was just like, I could relate. She was welcoming and made me feel comfortable. Everybody has different beliefs. What I like about Family Spirit is that it takes that into consideration, honoring their beliefs and their background for different cultures. He babbles all the time and like he'll point to banana and say, you want banana? So that's kind of how we communicate and know what he does want and what he doesn't. Politics is a family affair in the South Dakota State Legislature. Shirley Snavy has this interview with Representative Tyler Tordston, whose mother, Tamara St. John, is also in the South Dakota House. Take a look. I kind of convinced her to, to run. I told her I'd help her. Uh, I, I'll help you get signatures. I'll help you, you know, pound signs and, and uh, run your campaign for you if you run. And so she ran in 2017, got in 2018. Now she's in her third term. And so then when I was running, people were like, well, that's so cool that you're following in your mom's footsteps. Um, but they didn't realize that I was kind of the political political beast behind the scenes, but she has been phenomenal at it. And uh, it's been a lot of fun being able to serve with her at the same time, too. And uh, we, we get to be on one of the same committees together. And we don't always vote the same, but that's kind of fun. <laughs> just adds, a, adds a, a good element to it all. I do care about tribal relations in South Dakota. Just being a, I, I sub tell people a dual citizen, a South Dakota, an American but also a proud tribal member from my, my home tribe. And so 
and I always feel like there's we're, we're on the right trajectory, but there's more that we can do. So that's been a big emphasis for me growing up is that I want to find a way to learn the game and make change from within. Um, just because I felt like there wasn't enough tribal people involved at the state level or at the federal level too. Um, and so that was a big emphasis for me. The other one I'll say is education. Uh, I, I tell people I'm uniquely qualified out of 105 legislators, I'm the youngest one. And so I'm the most closely removed from my higher ed experience, but also most closely removed from my K-12 experience. In addition, I got two little boys, uh, almost four years old, almost two years old. And so kindergarten for us is going to be right around the corner. So I'm uh, uniquely interested in making sure that we get public education correctly. What I also like about our legislature this last class is that we have the most tribal member legislators in our history serving. Eight out of 105 enrolled members. There's probably more that legislators too that have some sort of you know descendancy or uh, ancestry piece there, but um, eight tribal member legislators, four Republican, four Democrat, six of us in the House, two in the Senate. And that just brings a better perspective. That's better for governance in general. For the eight Native American legislators serving in South Dakota, state tribal relations continues to be an issue. For me, it's it's been a, uh, an important subject because I feel like we can, there's so much more we can do. There's more bridges to be built. Um, you know, I had the fortune of working with Senator Brown, so I was the state director of tribal affairs and got to work on that federal government, you know, government to government relationship with the tribes. And the state tribal relationship is a little bit more difficult. And part of that is naturally because of jurisdictional challenges, resource challenges, whatever it may be. Um, but I try to remind people, even if it doesn't feel like it and look like it all the time, uh, we really are heading in the right direction. You go back to Governor Mickelson with his year of reconciliation with Tim Gallego and, and the other folks too, a part of that effort. And then uh, you look at the other administration since and the legislature since we've had a, um, a state tribal relations committee in the legislature since the 90s that still is an operation today. Um, when I interned in 2013, we didn't have very many tribal member legislators then. You didn't see tribal leaders coming to testify or pitch bills. We didn't have a state of the tribes address like we do the state of the state with the governor or the state of the judiciary with the Supreme Court. Um, and so we have those things. And so, again, I feel like we're heading in the right direction. Last month, State Senator Sean Bordeaux told ICT that tribal leaders were upset with remarks Governor Christy Nome made regarding Mexican drug cartels coming to the reservations. I was one of the legislators. Me and Representative Perry Puyer um, went and visited with the governor the next morning and got to got a, kind of one-on-one -on -one with her and a couple of her advisors. And we were able to just kind of share thoughts, share comments. And really, the takeaway take, take away from that, it was a good meeting. It was productive. Um, really, I mean, I just kind of reminded her and let her know, you know, you have tribal member legislators here and you have tribal chairmen that um, this batch of tribal chairmen, tribal leadership, for the most part, uh, they're willing to work together and they want to find ways. And I hear that same thing from her and her team, too. So, again, I don't think that we're that far apart. But sometimes we let words or we take things out of context on both sides and we, we blow it up into a bigger thing than it needs to be. And again, that doesn't solve any problems. That's not helping anybody. Um, and so, kind of my advice there was, well, lean on us. Let us, as citizen legislators, let us help build bridges too. And, you know, communication and consultation is so important. And, uh, like, I, I talked to my chairman, and, you know, part of that was, well, geez, if you're going to mention us in your speech, just give me a courtesy heads up. I've, I've identified, I call it like a kind of spokes on the wheel or a healthy community continuum. All communities, what they really need is they need public safety, they need housing. They need access to health care. They need quality education for their kids. They need economic opportunity, and they need the infrastructure for all of that. And if any one of those folks is damaged, you're going to feel it in a community. And, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our tribal communities, multiple spokes are broken. And so what can we do to try to um, get creative and find some of those solutions? Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that do care. Again, we have a lot of tribal leaders that sometimes the political scientists in me wish that they weren't, you know, two-year terms, and they have a little bit more time to uh, kind of tackle these issues because they're dealing with, we have the large land-based tribes up in South Dakota and significant populations and really rural. And so, I mean, those those are some some key things that we got to figure out and what can we do to work together. And again, that's why I've always tried to make change from within, whether it was in a federal uh, government role or whether it's in the state government role, what can we do to build partnerships for our people? And I got to give a shout out to, you know, some of my colleagues too, um, including the uh, you know, one, probably my favorite legislator, I have to say that, but but she she really is Representative St. John. She got her Indian Child Welfare Advisory Council bill passed this this year. So important. And and I think that that's, that's a good effort. I had a bill on tribal housing for housing infrastructure last year. We passed a $200 million infrastructure program. 
Um, and then the tribes were accidentally unintended consequence cut out. And so that was something we got sailed through. It was one of the first bills that got to the governor's desk and got signed into law. Um, you know, the, the tribal flags issue has been a, an up and down roller coaster for the last four or five years. And my message to anybody is, you know, we need to get those flags up. We need to get them in the state capitol because that's, that's, that's state capitals for all of us. And again, when I see those kids and when I get my little boys uh, coming to visit me in the capitol too, I want them to look up and I want them to see their American flag, their South Dakota state flag, and their system opt-in and the Yankton Sioux tribal flag. And that's important for that next generation. And so I'm hoping that eventually people can put the politics aside and that we can we can do that for the next generation. We need to all have that mindset going forward. And um, there's a lot of us that feel that way. And so I'm going to just keep keep trying to get some wins and keep trying to have conversations and see what we can do to do that, because that's important for all of us. Arve tuat tavai which is Ute for today is a good day. Arave is today, Tuat is good, and Tavai is day. Arave Tuat Tavai, which is Ute for today is a good day. That is a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit us at ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people.